I'm going to take advantage of the speaker exemption. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, thank you guys for, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Thomas Smith. Uh, I suppose the intro, I'm an admin, not a dev, so I have to warn you. Uh, I am the maintainer for the NSH port in OpenBSD, uh, and I assist the author and founder of the NSH project, Chris Compucio. And it is very much, he's Batman, and I'm Robin's baby brother's cousin, something like that. Um, so I don't speak for the OpenBSD project, uh, I'm a user, and uh, I'm probably trampling, today I'd be trampling over the shoulders of giants, um, like such as Chris Capucho, Stuart Henderson, uh, Kurt Mosichuk, who helped me with the, me getting into ports, and I really appreciate his help and guidance. And of course, uh, I'd have to say Chris Capucho has been more than generous in accepting some terrible patches from me and making minor tweaks to actually make make the patches fix the compile errors without making the program explode. So a shout out to Chris for his generosity and just not actually screaming at me going, what were you doing? But uh, anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, I suppose for me, OpenBSD and indeed FreeBSD uh, in, in the areas I use it, for all the BSD projects have made my working life easier. So it's, uh, so I really do appreciate all the generosity of time and effort you put into the code. And uh, I suppose I'd like to just say, it, if you're using some obscure project or a project that uh, it is nice just to say hi to the developer, buy him a beer if they like that, or whatever their poison is. And, uh, and also just even just send them emails with good positive feedback, you know. Um, so uh, I'm an engineer and a business owner. I really like the road less traveled and um, I like to try and get a, some sort of deep understanding of the issues at hand. Um, and I, I suppose I, I've always found myself in IT, always been, uh, as my friend said, you know that thing in front of you, Tom? It's called the curve. <laughs> so, uh, so I've always just tried to, to catch up and try and catch that curve, but uh, it's a moving target, you know yourself. Uh, Chris Capucho, uh, surprisingly similar profile. He has an ISP in the United States in Oregon. Um, he's the author of NSH and he's also the author of Flash RD, which was to help run um, uh, OpenBSD on uh, flash drives when flash drives were much more unreliable than they are today. And in areas where you don't have a data center type power and cooling environment, um, and so where you, you know, you, you can't effectively rely on it. And I suppose this is the main reason why you see on so many network appliances that you, you generally don't write to the config, the, the actual OS is pretty much static, uh, or you don't write to the disk, the, the, the config is static. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides just for the base, but I, basically I've been in IT since 2000, and I've dabbled in different, being introduced to Linux first, then going on to the FreeBSD, uh, through my friends in Redbrick in DCU and a shout out to them. Uh, although they gave out to me that I didn't spend too much time on the terminal, so apologies. Um, I, I'm trying to make up for it now. Um, uh, just from our side of it, uh, being an ISP, we use OpenBSD wherever we can. Uh, or where, and uh, it's a case of if we can, we think we should at least try. Um, so we use DNS, the recursive DNS as far as authoritative and recursive DNS servers uh, using obviously the NSH from the NLNet project, um, which is in base, which is brilliant. Open NTPD for timekeeping, which anyone who's used OSPF or any timer-based uh, networking protocol, it's absolutely critical to have synchronized time. Uh, it also helps with uh, incident management and kind of understanding what happened uh, on an incident on your network, be it security or um, uh, an actual fault. Uh, fault, fault diagnostics and resolution. Um, we use RelayD for some load balancing and SSL termination or TLS termination, I think is the more fashionable term for it nowadays. Uh, although I'll probably be correct afterwards, it's not a fashion statement, but uh, I'm sure there's something more technical uh, related to it. And thanks Theo for his talk on, uh, on TLS uh, earlier on in the, in the uh, conference. Um, obviously, we use the PF firewall and we use uh, them as network termination units or client premises equipment. Um, so uh, 
why OpenBSD? Well, I just think the design, the implementation, the syntax of the PF, BGPDE, the network configuration interface is brief, but very profound, and you can really do some lovely stuff. So why, why am I talking about NSH? Well, NSH is um, it's a CLI intended for, uh, for OpenBSD network appliances. There is some interest in FreeBSD, and I think we probably, and it, I think depending on how well we get the configuration language done, and any of you, those who are linguistic experts and you know, I, I would like to have a chat with you about that. Because initially NSH was about, oh, let's make it look like Cisco or a well-known operating system that rhymes with San Francisco or something like that. Um, and of course, a lot of network vendors then, in order to try and take some market share, made their equipment behave and look like a Cisco command line interface. And so from that point of view, um, so with that in mind, that's what Chris's initial aim was, was to actually make it just behave like a Cisco device and make it easier for someone who's trained on Cisco to use OpenBSD. And that's a kind of a really cool thing, you know? So <coughs> um, I just want to talk about a very simple example. Um, if you have a switch and you have a VLAN 101, so VLAN is just carving up a switch into virtual net local area networks. Um, and we're just going to call it 101. And, and we want to make one of the ports an access port and one of the ports a trunk port, OK, on the switch. So it's very simple config. Um, and we want to disable spanning tree, because spanning tree um, is terrible. Um, that said, uh, if any of you design spanning tree, thanks, because it does suck less than the loops it prevents. Uh, but uh, it can. Uh, <laughs> If it's misconfigured, uh, so it's more the mis maybe it's the engineer sucks, to be fair. But uh, I think we've all been stung with a spanning tree incident at one stage or another. <coughs> and disable any other discovery protocols. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go through what I, just a couple of configs that you would see on a typical network device that you would see, and you kind of go, what's going on here, okay? So here's a brocade, it's an old brocade VDX6720. So you've host name, just set the name of the switch so it kind of appears in the, on the prompt so that at least you know what device you're on. Um, you've got an interface VLAN uh, that declares that you want a VLAN. You call it, you give it some description, which is fine. And then obviously you need to apply that VLAN to a particular interface. So in this case, we're just going to cover the trunk port because it's a bit more involved. But it's kind of simple. You've got interface 10 gigabit ethernet, uh, chassis number one, blade number zero, port number 10. So on most switches, it would look like that because there, most people just have a single one U uh, switch. Anyway, so you've got to reset the MTU to the maximum that the chipset would allow uh, so that we don't run into any in, uh, issues with uh, storage area networks um, where people might want to run jumbo frames or large but frames that uh, exceed 15, 14 bytes plus the VLAN header plus the CRC 15, 1518 or 1522, depending on which document you read. Uh, one includes the CRC checksum that you never see in, in Wireshark because the card has already stripped it. But anyway, I'm digressing a little bit. But so we've got switch port. So we say we want this to act as a switch port because some switches are sophisticated and they might be actually a router as well. So you have to say, I want to use this as a switchboard. I want to use it in mode trunk, which means I want to use it as a VLAN, like I want to use tagged VLANs out of it. And then we say switchboard trunk allowed VLAN add 101. So we've added that. Um, we do BPU drop enable, which is handy if you're facing customers and you don't trust them. So you don't want them to inject spanning tree events into your network, which is a, uh, just a pro tip there. But anyway, and we say we don't want to use spanning tree on this port at all. So we're not trying to communicate or send anything themselves. Um, we disable LLDP and we just say no shutdown, which is a nice way of saying. So I'm going into detail with this, but I promise you uh, it's, we'll, and you can also see at the top, we've set the NTP servers. So just to our two NTP servers on our network. Now, if we look at an Arista, you start to see there's kind of, a pattern. They're not exactly the same, but they're kind of close enough that if you type NTP in double tab, 
it'll say, oh, do you want to specify the server? You know, um, you'll see that there's a declaration of the VLAN again, VLAN 101, and then you have the interface, and instead of 10 gigabit Ethernet, they have just Ethernet 9 slash 2, um, because uh, it's a 40 gig switch, so the 9 is the ninth port, 40 gig port, 2 is the second 10 gig interface of the four 10 gig interfaces on that 40 gig port. And we see we have an MTU, we can do a nice description as well, which is nice. And we've got switchboard trunk, allow VLAN 101, switchboard mode trunk, switchboard. And then we're doing all these, disabling the protocols again. Again, two different vendors, but very similar config. Must be a conspiracy somewhere. Anyway, so then we go and look at a Cisco 2960S, nothing special, it's kind of a low end switch. But again, you see here, oh, we've set the host name, NTP peer this time instead of NTP server. But again, it's kind of, the syntax is kind of usable and it's close enough that you will find your way around it. You know, uh, you'll find a way of configuring NTP if you were asked to do it. It's not close enough that it will still annoy you a little bit, but at least, uh, you know, you can't just copy from an Arista to a Brocade to a Cisco. You have to do some tweaks and work out what's going on. Um, <coughs> and it keeps people like me in a job where we kind of say, well, it's not so easy to migrate. Uh, so we go VLAN 101, we have a description, we can put a description into it, and then obviously then we set it on an interface which happens to be chassis one, blade zero, and uh, port six, and it's gigabit ethernet, switch port among trunk, so it's all the same. So we're seeing TP-Link, again, another low cost switch, probably using a a Broadcom or a Marvel reference implementation. Again, using a very similar config strategy. Um, you've got your host name, you've got your declaration of your VLAN, and how to apply the VLAN to the port. If we look at Ubiquiti, uh, this is where it kind of gets a little bit further away from the standard. Um, and so my advice to you is if you ever get a switch from a new vendor and you think you know how to configure the command line, what I would do is save yourself a lot of hassle, open the web configuration interface, and configure it visually on the web configuration interface, and then do a show run. And Ubiquity will surprise you with a very unusual uh, configuration, just slightly with this VLAN participation, exclude and include. But again, the principle is the same. You declare your VLAN, and you have all these types of... Uh, uh, <coughs> you have all these types of uh, configuration. You'll see there's just one item here. I've got switch port protected, um, and that's just a nice port isolation issue, which is a really handy way of uh, limiting broadcast domains, but also eliminating layer two threats on untrusted networks, access networks, so campus networks like these fine places, um, or hotel networks where you provide LAN ports. So what the protected ports generally do is if you put them all in the same group, they're all isolated from each other. Um, so, when, so if someone runs a rogue DHCP server or backends the wrong type of TP-Link uh, Wi-Fi router into the campus network to try and take it down with a DHCP uh, server, well, uh, this would actually prevent that. So it's just a really nice uh, tool, uh, port isolation, and it cuts out an enormous amount of crappy stuff that a man, someone trying to hijack you know, poison arc and stuff like that is not possible with that. Um, did anyone notice a, a pattern-ish emerging there? Yeah, cool. At least one person's awake here. Um, so if we were to do this in OpenBSD using the standard OpenBSD tools, uh, we might edit with my favorite editor, plugging MG here. Um, you'd edit it and we might say we call it a VLAN ag node or something like that, just being uh, a little bit nerdy there. Then we go mg slash etc hostname.ix0 because that particular system happens to have an Intel 10 gigabit network card, so OpenBSD labels the interface based on the driver and then the port number uh, according to some magic. Uh, we then just set the MTU to 2992. Uh, 9,216, and we set the interface to up. So that's all we're doing. <coughs> we do the same to the second physical interface. 
But you'll notice also, just to be clarify, on the previous slides, I only showed you the trunk port config, because the access port configurations is just like saying access VLAN 101. It's simple. But uh, just when you're trying to do it on an open BSD box, if you're coming from a switch background, it's, a, it's a diff just a slightly different mindset. So of course, then we, what you have to do is we have to create a VLAN 101, like a tagged interface on one of the interfaces. So we put it on, we say to its parents, so we say, we want VLAN 101 to be a sub interface of IX1, uh, okay? So the Intel. Um, and we want to set the MTU. We set the VNet ID, which is the VLAN tag. Um, and uh, we just set it up. And if we look at the bridge configuration, we would use my favorite editor again, hostname.bridge101. Um, we set the max addresses to a particular number that matches your network. Uh, I think, uh, allegedly, I would imagine if you use more max addresses, it would use slightly more RAM, uh, allegedly. I think that's probably true. Uh, and then the timeout's 300. A tip for any of you network lads is try and align your ARP timeouts to your bridge timeouts. And certainly don't ever have your ARP timeout longer than your bridge timeout, or you'll have nice unicast floods, which is, um, you'll know about them when you get them, but they're, they're not particularly pleasant, particularly if someone has a 100 meg UDP stream, and then it's replicated across every port in your layer two domain, it can be quite nasty. And if they are wireless in there, you're going to really have suffering uh, and pain. Um, but then you have, so we have max address, we set it to up. And then what we're doing is we're adding the ports in. So we, we in, in, in a switch, when you declare a VLAN, you're just saying, hey, I just want a VLAN 101. In OverBSD, what you're saying is, well, I need a forwarding domain, a layer two forwarding domain, so it's a bridge. Um, and we need to add it in. So we add in IX0, the physical interface IX0. So that's going to be like an access port. <coughs> um, <coughs> sorry. Add. So then we add VLAN 101, and we say it's protected, and we join it, and we say it's VLAN 101, and it's in group, protected group one. So just uh, that was the feature that MPI plus the OpenBSD project implemented, um, uh, uh, which I contributed in a very small way to, but like really, really small. As in, I asked for it, uh, and then they delivered it. it was, it's, it's actually it's the ideal uh, model for open source development, actually. Um, uh, and so then, and we also just minus STP. Um, but uh, certainly, it did really help an awful lot. But uh, so basically, any device that's in a protected group, that's in the same protected group, is isolated from everyone else in that protected group. And that's really nice, So because what you want is you may want to have your untrusted customers who are connecting to your hotel network uh, not to be allowed to see each other, but they need to be able to see the local gateway. So you put the gateway or a printer or some service, maybe a file server that they want to access uh, or a web, you know, inter intranet website in a different protected port group, and they can all see each, they can see the people in the different protected groups, but not the ones in the same one, which is really nice. And you can also cascade it. You can make them members of multiple protected groups, which was a feature. Oh, there we go. It's a feature I didn't ask for, but I got free of charge uh, because of uh, open source peer review. And someone saying, ah, oh, well, we can actually go one step further. Doesn't create any complexity and actually delivers a better result. And it's an example of why many eyes in open source uh, works. And uh, I really do thank the developers and MPI for the, I suppose, the collaboration in the back end and looking at it. So I really appreciate it. And of course, it was useful for VMMs so that you could isolate VMMs from each other. Or I'm using the wrong terminology there, but move it, just let it slide, just let it slide briefly. Um, so then obviously, you see, I just to continue on with the OVC, the standard config, you then might want to change your NTPD configuration to have, you know, you'd have to edit ntpd.conf, you'd have to restart it, and then you'd have to restart the network to apply the changes, and that's assuming that there wasn't any conflicting configuration on the devices beforehand, okay? So that's typically um, what would happen, uh, you know, on your previous one. We could do it as an interactive and an rc.local script, and that kind of does it, as far as I know. 
Uh, I'm pretty certain it does. Um, and effectively, we're just using the if config tools that are already there. Um, and that is quite readable. Like, a, you know, I was looking at it last night and going, yeah, you could, you could kind of work with that, no problem. Um, and you just have to restart the ntpd.conf uh, because, of course, if config changes take effect immediately. Um, and so why would I use NSH again? I know I'm asking that question again, but I suppose the part of the reason is if you're not familiar with OpenBSD and you're asked to support it, uh, which happens when you're asking junior guys to solve problems for you on the network, uh, they're faced with a turbulent with a flashing cursor, and they're like, which file do I go and read? How do I understand the configuration of the server? And it does take a little bit of time to actually work out what's going on. It's perfectly possible. Um, and if you use this, I do have a controversial opinion about the capital T for change in routing domain, but that's just because I just don't like using shift on, uh, but uh, maybe we can put a patch in to make uh, OpenBSD case insensitive on the command line. That might help. Um, but uh, comments later, welcome, please. <laughs> so then, um, so, so where's the problem? Okay, we well, can step one, you can do the if config, you can look through it, look for everything star.conf. Uh, nice pro tip would be to check rcctl ls starters so you can actually see what's actually uh, running on the system. Um, particularly if, you know, if your customer said this is not working or something's not working. Um, and usually, because if it's a non-technical user, they'll just go, uh, I can't work, something's wrong, nothing's working for me. And you kind of go, well, this is the server that serves them, so what is the daemon? That, and at least then they can kind of go through it. You can look for it. And after reviewing all that, it will resolve the customer issue. Um, so NSH, if it was fully functional and implemented everything that OpenBSD could implement, Theoretically, we could just do show running configuration. Um, and so if we were to do show running configuration, and by the way, show running configuration is kind of like the configuration syntax as well. So we can kind of establish that, okay, we have an ag node, we've named that. It has two physical interfaces, IX0, IX1. They're not shut down, so someone probably wants to use them. We have an interface of VLAN 101. We have a bridge VLAN 101, so chances are we're using a layer two forward in domain. And we've it configured. And you can see here, there's one subtle difference there that there's no mention of the protected ports. And that's because the protected ports feature is not fully implemented in NSH. So this is where you, we have the, the departure from where it is and where we want it to be. Um, and, so, and so what we have here, what's really nice about uh, NTPD and what's also saved us a lot, I say, think saved Chris a lot of sanity, because uh, he has shouldered a lot more the burden, a lot more, infinitely more, is that we've got what NSH has been smart enough not to try and keep up with all the config changes and all the feature implementations of each daemon. And so it wraps around the control commands, and it wraps around. And effectively, that NTP rules, you could almost say, is slash etc ntpd.com. Um, and the, that's literally, literally like, uh, and it's just pushing that into the daemon. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and then just NTP enable. And so that, so that, um, so if you're new to NSH, you can also use it to read the just running config and just see what's on the kernel. It's also useful, I would ask, for people to run it just to see how, the thing, how it differs from what they're expecting. So for instance, if you use a protected port, you get a nasty surprise. You go, well, there's no, I've configured protected ports in the kernel, and you haven't implemented it in NSH. So what's going on there? And so I would welcome any feedback where you say, hey, this doesn't work. Or, or, and, so, um, and also, if you're trying to dabble in it, a safe way, or I think a safe way of using it, is just to go show running config. Don't do any changes in that and keep using your traditional uh, tools so that you could actually assess what, what config changes are not being picked up by NSH. If they're not being picked up by NSH, chances are we can't configure with NSH, and that's something that needs to be remedied. Um, like the idea, particularly for me in terms of trying, my journey of trying to understand the code, 
and my understanding is limited, I'd, I'll fully admit, is to actually do a gap analysis, like for instance, on CIS CTLs or CIS controls uh, for like, uh, you know, there's the ones that are there for controlling IP forwarding. Do you want to turn on IP forwarding or not? Do you want to make it a router or not? Or do you want to make it a firewall <laughs> that for poor forwards? Um, and in that case, you know, there's a CIS CTL for that, but there wasn't one for uh, changing ARP timeouts or ARP, uh, you know, the, the, the timeout before retrying uh, an ARP request. Um, so there's always that. So we do welcome gap analysis and feedback on this. Um, so recent improvements, uh, they've added WireGuard support. Um, and, you know, he has like the VEB uh, support for VEB interface, uh, two port Mac relay, which is nice as well, um, and support for interface monitoring mode. Uh, public service obligation at BI, where's the exit sign? This is just, uh, uh, I'll just slag it a little bit, but um, uh, the graveyard of many a configuration file, just my desperate attempt to get out of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the config file. So um, uh, the improvements coming soon and waiting on an OK. So we've improved the manual page. So we ported the demand page from text to Mandoc or MDoc, sorry, Ingo. And I really appreciate the, the help and, and uh, stewardship of Ingo, who gave me very generous feedback um, on trying to improve the quality of it. Uh, I would say that MDoc is, is tough as a writer, but when you see the results as a reader and being able to search stuff, it is a phenomenal, uh, it is just really a phenomenal project. So I really do appreciate the work that Ingo and indeed Chris Taps initially uh, on it, so just a shout out to them. Um, what we've also done is a new integration script because it's, it, you know, uh, the integration script is dangerous. So you have to back up the original config, all the daemons, all the network configs, and then import the basic configuration. So there's still a gap in what we can import and what we can't. Um, and so it's really targeted at someone saying, oh, I'd like to try OpenBSD as a router or a firewall. Or, or a layer two switch of some sort, um, like as a, in a software switch. And it's, it's targeted for maybe a newly installed box where it's not like your life's work, configuration work about to be trashed by a, a defaulting NSH config. Um, um, and we've implemented all the, the nest.inet sys controls that have evolved over the last, I suppose, 10 years in OpenBSD, thanks to Florian and, and all the other people who work a, a, on OpenBSD. Um, a shout out to two of my fellow DCU colleagues um, who joined us for the summer as part of a work placement program um, from the, my local university. And I really appreciate their efforts because uh, they, they had limited exposure to OpenBSD and then they were being asked to, to contribute to this. And, you know, they, they really uh, had a baptism of fire and they, they, they did some really good work. And uh, just so I want to say hi to Alan McGrath and Scott McDonald. Uh, if you're, they said, is there going to be a video? And I said, yes, and I will give you a shout out. So shout out. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best in their careers. Um, and they're just uh, really good guys. And I wish them all the best for their, uh, their file year. Um, so NSH install. Well, it's simple. You just go package add NSH. You can choose the static or dynamically linked flavor. Um, and in this state, you can just read it and uh, read the current kernel configuration. You won't see all the daemon configurations. Um, uh, that's just the way it is. But what you do get is you could actually, my father used to uh, always use uh, to make things more get atable. Um, so <laughs> to make it more accessible. So. <laughs> I just want to say hi to Dad as well, just on that one. But uh, to use the to use the NSH as a primary primary configuration interface, well, you have to back up the configs first because you're about to lose them all. And the second thing is you need to also then try and move them into a location where they might be imported. Okay, uh, I'd like so we do import the likes of pgpd.cov, ospf.cov, uh, edtpd.cov, and uh, that we are trying to narrow that gap of what we import. Um, again, what we're doing, just to be clear, whatever the configuration syntax of PF or RealAD or OpenBGPD or OSPFD, we're just taking that and we're wrapping around it. So we're just pushing it into a running config. 
other either BGP D rules for BGP stuff or uh, OSPF rules for OSPF stuff and obviously for relay D for your load balancer configs, okay? Um, and simply what you do with KSH, like let's say if you had a BGP router and you wanted to import it, you would do uh, CP, you copy the BGPD conf into var run BGPD conf to zero. Um, you move uh, the file then to a backup. And the reason why you move it is you, you don't want to have two, uh, a man or a woman can have uh, only one master. So it's like, which, which one are you using to configure the system? Um, and then by running BGP enable, it'll look for that dark config, that part of the config, look at that file location, go, right, that's your starting um, configuration. Um, so you can also obviously do it with the copying examples if you're new. Um, and what's really nice, I have to say, is when you run BGPD enable, uh, it will actually check the config file and say, hang on, there's errors. You know, it'll do what you're, you do with BGPD would normally do anyway, you know, uh, with BGP CTL and stuff like that with the reload command. Or BGP control, sorry. I just have a habit of just being literal because it's not actually controlled. But, anyway, but I know what you mean, sorry. Uh, so the next thing then we've got, uh, you can also run in NSH interactively. So you just type NSH in the command line. Um, you can update the config. So we can go, you can update the config like as a script and just say, whatever's in this file, I want you to execute as a script. Uh, and it might be enabling 100 interfaces, setting up OSPF and BGPD on them. So you can have whatever script, so you can do a script offline as a text and then just import it. Um, and then obviously there's the initialize the config, which you do kind of at startup, you know, you'd be, that's how you would start the daemon. Um, question, where should one, this is more if you can come up to me afterwards or in the bar later, um, uh, or if you'd like to grab the mic later on, uh, like where would you put the integration scripts? Um, like, you know, for that, like what's a good location? Uh, I don't think it goes in package readme. I'm thinking maybe var NSH in, in scripts or integration scripts or something like that. Because when I say integration scripts, it's like taking over, it's doing more than what you would, <laughs> you would expect a package add to do, because you certainly don't want package add, blow your config away and take over your machine. Uh, I think it'd be frowned upon to say the least. Um, to do on the high priority side of things, what do we want to do? We'd like to implement more support for newer and renamed daemons, like the Resolve D to, uh, to, 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 the, the daemon to control the contents of the resolve.conf, um, Slack D, obviously the stateless auto configuration for IPv6 net. We want to be able to control the neighbor discovery protocol in IPv6 version six. Newer bridge features, such as protect ports, um, and then maybe the, let's say, less commonly used devices such as, you know, uh, 4G modems and stuff like that, or 5G modems. Um, <clears throat> and then implement, let's say, improved uh, support for the actual DAC clients as well. So there's been improvements all the time, primarily, I think, for people who are on laptops and are moving from network to network. Um, but, uh, and we need to take account of that in NSH to be fully functional. It's useful also for us, so for 10 minutes, thank you very much for that. Peter Hanstein, author of PF and a great educator, thank you. Sorry for <laughs> putting the spotlight on you. So then, uh, and just like what we find um, with, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. For if you have an ISP and you're trying to run like a, a client units and you want to be able to update them and, and push config, you know, using the DSPD, the, the integration of these is crucial. Like it seems trivial if you have static configs, but if you are trying to do devices on mass, the integration of these, and you know, I have to pay tribute to Florian and Pamela and the guys and all the people who've been helping us uh, uh, by improving the support for the problem of having multiple different network cards with multiple different sources of configuration uh, and prioritizing that. So it is pretty nice what the, the work they've been doing. Um, to do, there's a long to-do list, so uh, volunteers welcome. Um, um, but like if you consider like how to support additional uh, packages that we would use commonly like OpenVPN, 
Um, PMACCT, uh, uh, great, if you haven't used it, it's a great flow aggregator and disaggregator and sorter uh, for you know, network flows. Um, it's written by Paolo Lucende, um, uh, and he worked for an Irish ISP when he was a young lad, and he, he actually wrote it, and it was a super approachable guy. Uh, and just, just anyway, it's a really cool project, actually. So just uh, if you have been used it and you work with flows, uh, you, I think you might want to use it. Um, and then PF top, if top, it's even just to use PF top is a great one for you know analyzing what wh where is your traffic being used on uh, on your firewall. Um, if top is great, you know when you're trying to work out what are my interfaces, it just gives you a kind of a graphical on the command line uh, uh, view of what's actually you know going through each individual interface. Um, Fastnetmon, if you're an ISP and you have gamers on your network, you know Fastnetmon, um, or if you don't, you will want to know it, because uh, uh, and it's a brilliant piece of software by Pavel Ostinov. I'm probably butchering his last name, but... Um, but uh, and then if we re uh, then review, the, I think place where we can really learn from is BGP CTL. Anyone who uses BGP or BGP control, um, thanks Claudio and Job and Tio and Tio for all that. Uh, work that they've done on it, but because of the amount of data that you're processing, like if you're searching for internet routes um, and looking up, uh, you know, uh, uh, items on that, it, it really does help um, it, to, to know that these guys know how to process that data and maybe we need to learn from how BGP CTL, one, manage the BGP config, uh, and then also how to, how it reports back the status of the system. Um, so. Uh, and also the proof set model that it uses as well. Um, we also want to review the syntax to ensure they're succinct and understandable. Uh, it's something that probably OpenBSD does pretty well, uh, you know, the, in terms of naming things and the attention to detail, having people like Ingo around, you know, kind of making sure that uh, we're, you know, what we're saying is aligned with what we're doing. Uh, and I think it's. For me as a network administrator, uh, having a, a device that tells you what it's doing uh, truthfully and accurately and succinctly is really important. Um, and when there's a deviation between what's actually been said it's doing and what it's actually doing, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it really makes your life already, more, that's re already complicated, more complicated. Um, to do, um, there's a to-do list on, uh, um, Chris's uh, yellow man uh, GitHub account, and it's, uh, uh, it's on that URL there. Uh, so he wants to squash bugs. Uh, it's improving automation and uh, regression testing. So one of the things that was nice for me is I was only using maybe Open BS, uh, OSPFD, BGPD, PF, a couple of SysCTLs, and that was my kind of config. And it was only when I started exploring the different other daemons that NSH could control that you actually find other bugs. And it was in the process of updating the manual pages we managed to squash more bugs. So we could probably want to import, we want to improve then the import capability from other daemons as well. Um, uh, where else? Other software that I think is worth checking out and learning from. Uh, again, I'm putting open BGPD there and open um, BGP CTL. Because uh, I do think it's five minutes. Thank you. So, um, and uh, we've got the BSD router project, which uh, is nice. You know, it's BSD, and uh, uh, and there is definitely things to be learned from how they do stuff and and how we can, uh, I suppose, learn from uh, their their strengths. The FRR, the free it's a free range routing project. Um, again, that has a similar Cisco command line interface. It uses Zebra um, as the BGP daemon, um, which, uh, you know, for me, uh, from my experience of using Zebra and other platforms, it, it was challenging. Uh, I know it's been extensively rewritten as well, to be fair. Um, I suppose it's just a PTSD or something like that associated with uh, running it before, but uh, it, not on free range routing. It was actually on a, you know, not on a Linux box, but, uh, and it was a commercial project actually. Um, and then free router is a, a really interesting one. It's, it's based in Java, so it's kind of like, whoa, okay. Um, but if you look at the, the actual configuration syntax, 
uh, and uh, uh, it's sort of done by I think a Hungarian guy, um, and uh, like his regression testing scripts and his continuous integration, it's just it's remarkably efficient uh, in terms of how he's documented uh, uh, and he has replicated quite a significant portion of Cisco's functionality. And it's just something that I think we can learn from in terms of certainly the, the, the way he has all these sample configs that can be uh, uh, tested that every time he does a new build, it's there, it's, it's testing and, you know, it improves the quality and the reliability of the, the final product for, for the user community. Um, and it's just, it is something that uh, while, uh, and it does run on FreeBSD and it does run on Linux. Um, and he does have two images. I've had mixed results with it, but from a user interface point of view, it's, it's uh, phenomenal. Um, and uh, it has pretty decent performance, surprisingly. So it's trying to, I suppose, just learn from what other people have done and take, I suppose, rob all their good ideas. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and just, I suppose, you know, um, I suppose those who strive for perfection soon find it's a moving target. Um, I'm happy to take questions and um, uh, uh, do and so. Okay. Any question? Thank you, very interesting speech. And uh, I would like to ask you, you know, based on my experience, uh, uh, medium and large ISP are yeah. trying to get away from uh, command line as much as they can, right? They're trying to automate configuration. And uh, there are some, let's say, emerging technologies to do this, like, uh, for example, Young Models and Netcom. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience with OpenBSD with that? Um. I've been honest, I've, I've relied on the command line, but my uh, version of automation is a load of scripts that SSH into a box, run a command line, uh, and do it that way. Um, and I suppose we probably are trying to keep our configs as simple as possible because of that. So we try to, uh, as in, that it's replicatable, and it's not that, oh, if it's this type of interface, we do it this way. We try to use the same type of interface everywhere. And even if at the risk of some suboptimal configuration, we'll do that just to keep it standard. Um, it, one of the things that I, I had mentioned on the slides is on the to-do list, uh, Chris wants to do a kind of a web-based. So what I think, I think the way we'll approach it, um, and uh, you know, Chris is the leader of the project really, so but I think what we need to do is make sure that we dial in the command line, that the command line behaves itself as you would expect, like an OpenBSD configuration tool. And then after that is to tackle maybe some sort of a, a PrivCEF web server where you can do maybe REST commands and stuff like that, like what some of the major vendors have been doing for the last past few years. Um, but for me, like a, on the automation side of things, like, you know, uh, we, we've literally been just using uh, Ansible or are actually just shell scripts and you know um you know and our ansible with run books you know um but and that's kind of how we've been using it also i don't think uh, like in terms of you know nsh what i like about it at the moment is we're just using we're kind of using the ssh as the kind of the network facing interface so that's locked down anyway and then we're just relying on it locally uh, as as you know just a root user um, there, we are looking at a PrivCEP model for that, but uh, it's kind of hard because for now, what we want to do is just be able to configure stuff. And generally, if you're changing any network configuration in the kernel, you're running as root anyway. So it's, it's kind of, but if you then start having, you know, users of, let's say, with less, you know, like a, a help desk staff or junior staff where you don't want them making changes, then we do need to have that type of uh, a proof set model, like, and it's appropriate. We, we need to be looking towards there. Um, uh, and certainly if you had a multi-tenanted solution, yeah, yeah it's, it's, that'd be much more um, complicated. But uh, 
One thing I will say is NSH is uh, routing domain aware, so that, that is pretty nice. But it's routing domain aware, but you're just the one user, you know, interface with all the routing domains. So it's not like we can just say, oh, here's your client configuration as client X, and you can edit it yourself if you want. So it's not there yet on that front. Um, but yeah, so, so on the automation front, uh, like we're just using shell scripts, and, and really the focus is to get, to align NSH's capability with all the development, the extensive improvements in the network stack in OpenBSD and the routing daemons for the past 10 years. Uh, and we're, we're, we have a bit of catch up to do there. You know, automation is one, one part of the whole aspect, right? There's also data validation, which is really important. And somehow Yang is taking care of this part. This is yeah. what I was asking. And then I don't know if we have time, just like a second question, instead of SNMP and like, like a sort of a, a pushing strategy to do monitoring, is there anything else that we can use like similar to, uh, uh, sorry, instead of pooling strategy, is there anything else we can use? Well, you, like you, have push syslog. you have syslog, so we, you know, um, uh, and so syslog is a pushing strategy, you know, um, as long as you have the connectivity, obviously if you, you know, um, like, so if, if you lose your uplink and there was a whole stream of information that you would like for, but that the uplink is used to take that, S to, uh, sorry, syslog traffic, you're going to lose it. But, uh, so syslog is there. Um, there is SNMPD. I don't know, does that do traps, does it? It's getting there. It's getting there, but, it's, but so certainly syslog at least has it. So whatever you'd see in slash var log, messages, mm -hmm. var log daemon, it's there and, and you can adjust that. Uh, and that's what we've used on our, in our experience. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say in some ways, uh, like, uh, like uh, our ISP is quite small, you know, we're around 3000 users. Uh, so the number of devices, it's almost like we're, you know, each router is one of our enough. pets and, you know, they all have their personalities. We know them all individually, mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> so we probably need to get a, a bit more, but it is certainly on like the radar because if you want to grow and scale, you need to do that. Thanks very much for the question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Who's the artist? Uh, that's my daughter, Sophie. Um, so she painted them. Uh, so I, I tried to give her some pocket money to do it. But, uh, so she gave me one for my birthday, to be fair. So that was, uh, so that was uh, my daughter, Sophie. So uh, shameless plug for Sophie's artist. Her, um, I'm also into doing child labor, so if you want to, uh, if you want to get uh, uh, some art, uh, I can certainly, uh, you know, I can get her working every day, every day after school, and uh, we can push <laughs> out. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Thanks. Just to follow up on your network modeling co uh, question, there was a NetConf Yang uh, project to drive Alpine Linux at one point. Um, COVID kind of dried up the funding for that, but if you're Blake, can you speak up? Sorry. Sorry, mask. Um, there was a NetConf Yang project uh, to um, to drive Alpine Linux at one point with uh, with NetConf Yang and, and you know all the sys controls and network config and stuff. Um, COVID caused the funding for that project to dry up, but if you're interested, come talk to me. Okay. Right. Thanks, Blake. Anyone else? I, I don't bite, I swear. Any VI users who want to defend? I think we're pretty much out of time. So uh, as, a, as a traditional, uh, a gift from from the organizers a uh, lot of special thanks very much appreciate it and let, let's thank our speaker thank you guys